as the day goes on, they'll get to know each other better. Um, we've got a big audience here, so uh, by the time we've gone through the people's individual questions, by the time we've had a chance to talk to them all, um, it'll probably be a, a long day. And then, because uh, we're normal, uh, things go around what it's doing anyway. So they're going to have a chance to introduce themselves to the rest of so we're going to be nice or what have we got? Uh, no, you bring your own campaign. Okay, right. yeah, yeah. You're welcome to take photographs of the slides or whatever. I know, I think Chris is recording something. Is that right? Well, I'm just recording. Sam, um, Sam Lang has taken the recording of the previous um, from the book day one, so there'll be a bit of content. A lot of that content will be used. speaking today about my experiences and it has been a steep learning curve for me because I learned about holistic management quite late in life and it created a, a disaster. As with many people there are many there are more wrecks than there are successes because of the way we learn it and because of the paradigms that we have. So I went into a disaster. I lost millions of American dollars. And uh, when, asked, when asked, I asked Savory for help, he said nobody in my environment had mastered holistic management. So I was out there on my own. Anyway, I hooked up with Mark Bader of Free Choice Enterprises in Wisconsin, America. And he helped me with animal performance. Now Mark is an academic, but when it comes to practicality, he was not very good. And between us, we worked through how to get animal performance. So for some time now, I have looked at animal performance. I'm not interested in saving the world because I cannot save the world. But I need to save people on the land because we are not getting the return on our investment as we should be getting. And I feel that if I save enough people on the land and they can realize a reasonable income between them and I, we can make a difference in this world. And that's really what I'm about. So I talk about animal performance because that's the money end of the equation. And we need at all times animal performance, animal performance, animal performance. Don't worry about the world. Don't worry about the land, because when you've got enough animals, they will fix the land. And I will show you slides of bare ground, and within 18 months to two years, thick grass, and I put no seed down, I put no extra water down, I put no fertilizer down, all we've used is animals. So I've been doing what I'm doing now for roughly 12 years. And also, each time I go to a client and say the possibility is this or that, they do what they need to do and I keep learning and hence no book. Once a book is written, it's finite. That's what I believe. So I am no expert because I keep learning. Experts know it all. And I keep learning. So it's an exciting time in my life because I'm... In America, I spent a lot of time there from Mexico to Canada and everywhere in between. I only <coughs> spent about four months at home now. And the reason for that is we've handed over to the next generation. And you know, F and Father stands for fool. So everything that I might suggest to our son, 
it's not proven until he has done it. So the best thing I did was just hand the finances over to him because when I paid for the mistakes, it wasn't a mistake in his book. So the minute he paid for his own mistakes, it was a steep learning curve for him. And wherever I am in the world, he now phones me every morning to ask me questions. <laughs> and remember, the personal side of it is far more important than the financial. The money you can make once you've got it right. And you must practice and do things and listen to other people. But again, don't do anything unless you are confident and satisfied what you are doing is the right thing. Because there are many experts out there telling you all sorts of things. <coughs> but you have got to take responsibility for your decisions. And we on the land have failed to do that. So in terms of what's happened in society, we are the bottom feeders in the community. We are farmers and when you go into a room and somebody introduces you and you're a farmer, most people in that room will feel sorry for you. Guys, there's something wrong. But we've allowed it to happen. And we must take that back because in actual fact we're the only people in the community who can ha capture real energy and energy is money, money is energy, time is money and water is money. We should be the wealthiest people in the community. We work double the hours of the critters in town and yet we have half the recreational <coughs> time and the critters in town. So stop it. And nowhere in the world people don't think you need unique kind of museums. It's all over the world that this has happened. But nowhere else in the world does government get involved in businesses in town and tell them what they've got to do. But we farmers, the government's interfering the whole time and telling us what to do. And not only that, for 150 years we've implemented every decision has been scientifically proven. I beg to tell you that 99.9% .9 of what is scientifically proven relating to agriculture and the environment is faulty. That is why we land up where we are. Because we've made decisions given to us by other people and we've ended up in a situation where we cannot make a decent living. So please, take responsibility for your decisions. Tell other people to go packing and go back to town. You don't need any fertilizer. You don't need a baler, tractor, whatever else. Keep the money in your pocket, but please understand that they're not going to give up their good living easily. They're going to migrate to a different and easier way just to take your money off you. My forefathers slaughtered an animal, it went to the butcher, went to the consumer. There are 11 businesses now between me, the supplier, and the consumer, and they all live better than I live. And that's just an example. Does anybody disagree with what I'm saying? You're welcome to challenge me. You're welcome to ask questions. I cannot tell you everything I know. We've only got two days. But if you ask the question, I know which direction to go in connection with the slides that I'm going to give you. Because you, the audience here, will ask different questions to Dunedin. And that's good. Well, the trouble is people have got away with regulating and they will continue to regulate. Parliamentarians believe they're not working until they make another law. We in our country just ignore the regulation. <laughs> so if they tell you this is what you've got to do, for instance, fence off the waterways and animals aren't allowed there. Where did the big herds of animals water? They watered in the streams and the rivers and the ponds. But today you've got to fence it off because some critter in town doesn't know what cow shit in these water. Excuse the word. It's nonsense. It's faulty science. And we allow it to happen. So in our country the fence broke and oh, the cattle graze there and they graze there for a week because there's nobody to police the laws. And that's exactly the same in this country. Only is in Canada. In Canada they build monuments to keep the cattle in winter. I've told people when they make their bells to hide them over the timber on the other side because the inspector only drives on the road.
he's not a farmer, he won't get out of his car in that snow and go and check what's going on. And things have changed. They've now got healthy animals. The animals don't get sick because in the building they all got sick. We allowed it to happen because we conform. If the law is not just, don't conform. There are enough of you. The French are the only people who then block the roads with their big tractors which are subsidized by the government. <laughs> <laughs> They've got the guts to do it. But all of the rest of us can fall. It's just an open. So I'm going to be showing you a slide on my experiences and what I've seen and what happened. And really, the conclusion I've come to that when man came into the world or started farming domestic animals. We created a situation to limit the production because we could not cope with the volume of production that was possible. So in our country, we burn the grass every year to get the grass not to perform, not to grow so much grass. In this country, you graze it, you graze it into the roots so it doesn't perform. And then you wonder why you're going broke. It's all about using, use it or lose it, because it's about the energy. All wealth comes from the sun. So we capture this energy, we use it when it's at its maximum, we graze the grass in a vegetative stage, and we move on. So enjoy the next few days. If you don't like what I say, I don't care. But I've got to tell you, because if you want to do something different, it's possible. And I promise you, I'm not telling you any lies. I am a farmer. I know what it is to be lied to, because all most of my life, all these reps that come onto the property have lied to me. And they've made decisions for me, not leading me to where I want to be, but where they want to be. And all they're looking back is the money in their pocket. Okay. So we start with the soil and then there's no reason where to start except that really the soil sustains everything else we're trying to do. So it's the hole, it's the soil surface, it's the soil, and again the grasses. Not only the grasses, but animal performance, that is feeding the animals and then most of all animal performance. So I'll give you the basic principles that we're looking at. So all wealth comes from the sun. Anybody disagree? I'm happy to have a discussion about it. I don't argue. People, when I raise my voice, I just get passionate and excited. I start hyperventilating. That's why I've opened the door there, because I get hot. And if I get hot, I can't think straight. That's why we've got to open doors. <coughs> you guys can put on jackets if you get hot. Then there's a solar panel. Nothing more, nothing less. Energy is money. You inherit many times. The grass that grows on the land dictates the efficiency of the solar panel. What grows on the soil is a mirror image of what's in the soil in terms of the fungal bacterial relationship. And we can manipulate that to grow the plants we want to grow. And again, we put in these 11 seeds and half of them don't germinate because it's the wrong fungal bacterial relationship in our soils compared to some critter who told us to use them. And immediately you've wasted a bunch of money because you bought seed that you shouldn't have bought in the first place because there is more than enough seed on the ground for the next 200 years. You do not need new, improved plants. They've only been selected for the last 10 years. Do you think they can be better than these plants that have been selected for 2 million years? By seed. They require more fertilizer, they require more water, and then they wonder why we go broke. Keep the money in your pocket. So energy is the elusive part of the equation to achieve animal performance. Not protein. There's more than enough protein out there. And then you guys go and plant these 11 white crosses and grow beans. What do you think a bean has got? It's got excess protein. What are you doing? You're killing your animals with protein. 
The average life of a cow is one and a half lactations. People, is that not stupidity? We keep doing it. <coughs> so we need to change. And the closer we work with nature, the higher the chances of succeeding and making money. So again, look at nature or try and think of what happened out there. And I know you guys will say, oh, we were full of timber, we had no grasslands. And I mean, every New Zealand has got every excuse in the world. But guys, it's no different because you have changed the situation and you are wanting grasslands. But you guys control your grasslands so tight and strongly that they can't produce. You should be producing or having a stocking rate of over three times what you have. Take your financial bottom line, multiply it by three, but before you multiply it, remove all the expenditure because you don't need it, and all of a sudden you're a very wealthy person. Eat the plants in a vegetative stage. Extremely important because in a vegetative stage, the energy and the protein levels in the leaf are conducive to create animal performance. We will go into more detail. The protein and the nitrates are predominantly at the bottom of the plant because they come in with the water. And the energy is on the top of the plant because all well energy comes from the sun. Sun's rays go in straight lines. They don't take a left to the bottom of the plant and then another right. You have all experienced it. Watch the animal when they go into the paddock. They take one bite off the top of most plants. And if you leave them in there too long, they then take the second bite, which they shouldn't take. And so it goes on. Bite. Ask questions. Stop me if you disagree. I don't bite. So energy is money, money is energy, time is money, and water is money. And I did think at one stage that I need to mention the water in this country because I've done a lot of my work in South Island and I get too much water, whereas you guys are a little bit more brittle in this side. So I can quite happily talk about water. And when you make a decision, the comparison you use is the limiting factor in terms of money, energy, time, or water, to your decision and you will make the right decision. For instance, a factory might make a decision and one of the things they look at, how much more space have we got to expand? <coughs> All man-made additives, fuel, fertilizer, drenching, are there to rob the farmer of his hard-earned wealth. Next time you buy something in town, just pay for it and don't collect it. Make a donation of it. And you'll understand what I mean. Keep it in your pocket. Diversity of plants creates stability. If you have a monoculture, you are at risk because if the weather changes, and they talk about global warming, climate change, I don't know, anything to make money, people are stepping down our throats. People, there's been climate change all our lives. There's been climate change for two million years. Don't think it's going to stop. We have listened to a whole <laughs> lot of false science, and we can't power and do it. So the easiest increase in profit comes from increased stocking rate. The more animals we have, we can lose a bit of production but then we understand that this is what we, our solar panel is harvesting because energy is the elusive part of the equation to achieve animal performance, which is the money. We can back off if we want more performance per individual animal. And really all you need to monitor is kgs per hectare. The rest is irrelevant. The soil samples and what comes out of those soil samples is quality of life, you just wanting to know what's happening there. It's nothing there that is going to create a decision because it's there and you can do nothing about it except manage your livestock better and you'll improve that at no cost. Because if you do free choice minerals, you have 20 minerals out there and you watch the livestock, that will tell you more than what the soil sample tells you. 
Most soil sample laboratories are owned by fertilizer companies. People lie. Animals don't lie. So we can learn more about our soils by watching the animals because they will only take what they need and on top of that they then distribute it over the whole property free of charge because they only use it and then drop it. So the increased stocking rate at no cost comes from management. We need to learn how to manage differences and not manage to send the money to town. Let's deal with any disagreements before we go on. Because those are the basic principles of what I talk about. <coughs> and I will proceed now, from now until we finish, to show you what I'm talking about. Good question. How many of us here don't agree with that? You say who? You're asking who doesn't? Two of us. How many of us don't agree with what that says there? And then the next question is, how many of us behave as if we don't agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> you could not be advised if you've already heard me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, how hungry you are to make money? I do a lot of work with the Amish community. And five years ago, a guy came to me and he said this, that, and the other. We've got to do a million pounds of animal flesh per acre. He moved the animals every half hour. That evening, his milk was 20% up. Five years later, I tell him, you know what to do. Just move sooner and move faster. But in the interim, he's got married and he puts his hands in his head and he says, what about my quality of life? <laughs> Whatever, I don't care. All of you will do something different because you've got different levels of hunger to get out of debt or to earn more money. That's all. That's no difference to me. And don't ever say here and says, because I'm out of here and I'll deny it when I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that. So people ask me, what about methane and all these animals you're talking about? I said, I don't care because it's false science. There were more ruminants in the world before man started doing what we do. So don't even go there, people, because all the time we then go and challenge them, we're creating more publicity for them, and they love it. They just rub their hands and they say, oh, look at the publicity we get. It's stupidity. Just ignore them. It's like breaking rules. So I could never have done this without holistic management. And if you understand that in that circle we make decisions, but we're given advice from representatives from universities, and how many people of 80 years old do you know who've never achieved anything in life because every decision has been influenced by people who are making money off them instead of them keeping the money? So they stay in that circle and they never move forward. But with holistic management, we have a holistic goal, and that's a three-part goal, which is quality of life, forms of production, and future resource base. And it means that everything is an immediate decision, a medium-term decision, and a long-term decision. So every decision we make takes us where we want to be in terms of our business and our family. We then write down the whole under management because most people on the land do not understand how much money they can raise. If an opportunity arises, it's a bit like a train putting into the station. It stops for a few minutes and it pulls out and trains don't normally turn around. So if an opportunity arises, you must be ready to be able to raise the money or do what you need to do. Put everything in one file, understanding the whole under management, your ability, your talents, everything, your clients, your suppliers, is all in one file. So that we can then go forward and make a decision leading towards where we want to be in terms of our family in two generations time. Because if you don't start putting seeds in the air now, it's not going to happen then. And it's exactly the same with the trees we want in our property, etc., etc. But I'm not teaching holistic management. And then we have the ecosystem processes. 
the water cycle, the mineral cycle, the energy cycle, and community dynamics. They are all one. If you fiddle with one, you're fiddling with them all. But the beauty of holistic management is it puts it in a linear format that we can understand it because we as humans think in a linear format. We send rockets to the moon, we build computers, we build, we've got mechanics. It's all linear stuff. But the minute we get to the environment and the minute we get to agriculture, we have failed miserably. So holistic management takes this complex dimensional situation, puts it in a linear format, breaks it down that we can then look at it, investigate it, bring it together, make a decision, do it leading towards our holistic goal. We then have tools, and remember there are two new tools in the toolbox according to holistic management, which are the action of grazing and animal impact. And if we manage those two tools, remember humans cannot manage the soil. We can only manage tools that work on the soil. So we take the tool of the action of grazing and animal impact and we bring that into our decision making. It then creates a situation where we do not need all these inputs because nature before man had a purpose. They didn't have balance, they didn't have tractors and yet all those, those animals were in good condition and they bred. And there were more ruminants in the world then than there are now. So we then have the testing guidelines, and the seven testing guidelines, so the, the eighth one is common sense. What a testing guideline does, it tells you where to monitor in your decision. So if it has failed, the testing guidelines, that's where you need to monitor to make sure your decision stays on track. Unfortunately, I'm talking to an audience today who understands cricket. So when the guys go in and play cricket, the first side goes in and they have a certain graph that goes up with the number of runs they made. The second side comes in. If they intend beating the first side that batted, they need to keep as close as possible to that run rate. <coughs> otherwise, they're never going to achieve what they want to achieve and beat that other side. So we then have different planning procedures. We have land planning, biological monitoring, financial planning, and most importantly, grazing planning. And the grazing planning is to get you to the right place at the right time for the right reason. You plan backwards. It's no different from going to drive somewhere. You look at the map. You know what time you want to get there, and you plan backwards. And then you plan for contingency. So something is going to happen, you do this, you do that, and you look at all the problems that you might experience in the future. A plan is for the future. A map writing how many days you're in a paddock is history. Too many people in this country are using a map and just writing in the days they're in that paddock. Who cares? It's history. Plan for the future, know where you gain, it removes risk. So again, we've done everything that is scientifically proven. In science, everything has to be replicated, okay? It's got to be replicated, replicated, replicated. But we in this room are dealing with chaos. How do you replicate chaos? Silence is golden. You build flexibility into your plan. That's the only way to manage chaos. Because you never know what nature's going to throw at you in the next minute. And that's what you do. Plan accordingly. So you cannot graze without a grazing plan. And John is an expert at sorting all that out. And Siobhan is helping. And various people who are helping this RMPP have got a good idea on grazing planning. Listen to them, guys. Plan your grazing. Because it is too complex, multi-dimensional for us to contemplate in our small heads. Not mine, mine's too big. So we monitor and we make sure that we're going to get that decision moving in the right direction. And we make that decision. So yes, I might criticize holistic management because of losing the money that I lost. 
But again, I could never have learned what I have learned without holistic management. And really, in terms of money, what I lost is peanuts compared to what I made once I understood animal performance. And that's what I'm going to be telling you guys in the next couple of days. So we look at our business and we understand that all wealth comes from the sun. So we look at the financial weak link and it's energy conversion, product conversion, and marketing in that order. That is the chain of events. So we are conventional farmers, whatever you like to call you, farmers, ranchers. And we have six herds of animals. The minute we put two herds together, the area that those two herds together, the food has automatically doubled. So if you have six herds and you put them all together, you now have six times the food available for those animals. Because more land is capturing energy. Energy is the looser part of the equation to achieve animal performance. Does everybody understand that? It's very difficult to think that you've got double the food if you've got two herds. But that's exactly what happens. So if you decide to do something different and you decide to listen to us and do something that I'm talking about, you put the herds together, you automatically go to a product conversion week link where if you were conventionally stocked, you all of a sudden have too much grass, okay? So you're in a product conversion week link and you increase the number of animals until that product is now saturated. You flip over to an energy conversion week link once you're in an energy conversion week link, you might need to produce more water for livestock, or you need more fencing to create more food, which is product. So you flip backwards and forwards from product to energy, energy to product, until both those are saturated. And then to market your product, you just go into the market and you drop the price of your product. You've all of a sudden got the biggest market in the world without spending a cent. Am I wrong? And yet our academic institutions are teaching our precious sons and daughters that they've got to spend money on marketing first before they've got the product and they go broke just trying to get a market. Guys, it's all a guys to take the money off us, that's all. A market is mean dropping the price. If you guys all treble the stocking rate on your property, the price of lamb, mutton, beef, name it, is going to drop. But what's going to happen? Consumption is going to go through the roof. The fake meat is not even going to be reported in the press. We created the problem because we're always looking for a higher price. And in the meantime, on the right-hand side, we are limiting production. We are pushing our land down, managing it incorrectly so it doesn't come to its full potential. that up just so that people can understand what's involved in an animal and the ruminant and I'll leave it there for a few minutes so you guys can have a little bit of can have some water. So that is the only tool we need. The only thing with moving parts with an animal. Because it's an appreciating asset, not a depreciating asset. <coughs> so we look at the whole system. <coughs> okay. We look at the whole and if the soil but the soil surface, because that we can manipulate, the soil, the grass, 
I mean, he got there, and it says, I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. uh, are you happy with that curtain open there? Can you see enough, or do you want to pull it across a bit? It's up to you. And then, of course, the most important is animal performance, because that is the money. And we need to make money. If you don't make money, you can't progress. So we look at God's creation, and people are not telling you to get lied into New Zealand, that will just create chaos. More chaos than we've got. But what happened in the grasslands of the world that developed under a predator-prey relationship? So it's God's creation, and the closer we work with nature, the better the chance we have of succeeding. So in the predator-prey relationship, the herds move continually, the animals each got a bite off the tops of the plants as they moved, but the move was like a boiling pot. The animals from the front fell to the back, the ones in the middle came to the sides, and so they moved. And during the day, each animal raised to its full potential. And in the evening when they stopped, they were all full on the left-hand side. Between the hip and the first rib was full. Because the bacteria in the rumen, remember when you feed the ruminant, you're not feeding the animal, you're feeding the bacteria. And what happens is the bacteria, if you are grazing correctly, will say, bring it on guys, we're reproducing inside here. We want more of that food because we are reproducing and we need more food to sustain us. And they in turn feed the cow. When you go into non-growing season in many parts where the grass then goes brown, You've seen animals standing in very high grass, but on the left-hand side is getting hollower and hollower and hollower. The bacteria are sitting there, not breeding. They haven't got enough energy in their diet. They're saying, hang on, guys. Don't bring any more of that stuff in here. We can't cope with it. And then everybody says it's too dry a grass, and it's going through the body slowly. It's going through the body slowly because the bacteria aren't working on it. And they need more energy and maybe a touch of protein. Just a touch of protein. But we'll go into that later. So, what is God's creation? It's large herds at high, high stock, I think you point, and high stock density. Predator prey relationship, which we've spoken about. Any animal that was sick, lame, or lazy that fell out of the herd, was taken out, that DNA was removed from the herd. We need to act as predators on our herds, our animals, and in doing so, we remove that bad DNA from our herd because form follows function, and the function of the animal is to reproduce in the environment in which it's born, period. So if we remove those animals instead of game off to buy more food, to keep this animal alive and then start losing money. That money, that animal is better and you can do it and see what it does to your particular situation. If you sell that animal for whatever it's worth, put the money in your pocket and it's out of the herd, your herd will have less expenses as you go forward. So we do the predator-prey relationship. We need to understand that if you increase density, you shorten time. Time and density go together. They are not separate. We need animal impact because that's what happened when you had these high densities of ruminants with the predators chasing them, but we don't want predators chasing our animals. We put them in paddocks of a reasonable <coughs> size that we emulate the high density that the predator-prey relationship created. That's all. No more and no less. We allow the animal's selection. Is anybody in this room doubtful that the animal with the most selection will be the best conditioned animal on your property? Does anybody disagree? But then why do we graze it into the ground? Because we're frightened of the potential, that's why. So we create selection and every animal on the property deserves the best grass. Not the lamb, whatever, 
every animal deserves the best. If everything was getting the best, what would be your production? Don't starve the youth to try and get the pizza smaller. Because you are doing the opposite. You are trying to starve the animal. It's eating into the ground. All it's doing is eating more protein. It's protein that makes the fetus big. Not starving the animal. Excess protein makes huge fetuses. And then you wonder why your sheep can't lamb. Because it's your action trying to make a smaller fetus. That's all. It is faulty science to starve the animal. So we do something different. So we understand that all wealth comes from the sun, <coughs> energy is money, money is energy, and time is money. And I will repeat that numerous times, people, because you must do it until you dream about it. Because it is that simple. That's all. It is that simple. But remember, our academic institutions have to complicate it, otherwise they've got nothing to sell. Your precious sons and daughters won't be able to go to those institutions if they can't complicate it. And you've got to keep it simple as well. So we understand what happens, how <coughs> plants grow. The politicians choose our CO2. We understand the plant because it takes in the CO2. And we put on water and it lets off oxygen, but the, in the water, the H2O that comes to <coughs> the soil, all the nitrates, etc., come from the base of the plant. We can manipulate that square. Guys, if you want to stand up, stretch your legs, take a walk. You all just have coffee and what have you, five minutes and we'll be back. So you want to you. I need a new board.